Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar event. My name is Vicky Snook, and I am the Training and Learning Manager for Foodline UCC, which is located here in the Food Industry Training Unit at University College Cork. I am delighted to be joined by fellow panelists, Dr. Amy Jane Troy, who is the Project Director of Foodline UCC, and Professor Alan Kelly, who's our Vice Dean for External Engagement and also the Vice Head of the College of Science, Engineering and Food Science here in UCC. And finally, Professor Pranendu Vasavada, who is the Professor Emeritus of Food Science from the University of Wisconsin in River Falls. So, I'm going to hand over to Amy Jane in just a few moments to do a more formal introduction, but I just want to take a couple of seconds to talk everybody through some practical elements relating to the webinar. Firstly, we are delighted to be broadcasting live with you here this afternoon. If there is an issue between um, your video and audio, if there's a lag, it could be a connection issue on your end. So what I would say is just hold tough and it should rectify itself once you're in an area of a strong signal. Secondly, we are recording the event this afternoon for our colleagues who have registered for the event, but unfortunately can't join us at this time. And finally, we strongly encourage everybody to interact with us and ask the questions that you have. You can do this through the question and answer button, which should appear in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Just to note, we'll answer all of the questions after the presentation has finished. So Amy Jane, I might hand over to you now at this point. Brilliant. Thanks, Vicky, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fifth event in the current Foodline UCC lecture and webinar series. We're absolutely delighted to have so many people join us from all over the world today for this really interesting and also very timely discussion, particularly after a challenging two years. As Vicky mentioned, my name is Amy Jane Troy, and I'm the project director for Foodline UCC. Foodline UCC is the online leg of the Food Industry Training Unit, which is located here in the School of Food and Nutritional Sciences in University College Cork. You can see the campus of University College Cork behind me. Foodline UCC was developed in collaboration with Taste for Success Skillnet in a direct response to the growing need for increased blended and online learning and resources to support industry. Now we can see from the registration list that a huge number of people have engaged with us before through our courses and other webinars that we've run and so we're delighted to see you back with us again. For those who are engaging with us for the very first time, you're welcome. Just to give you some background, the Food Industry Training Unit, or FITU as we call it, provides part-time training and continued professional development for those working in the food, agri-food and seafood sectors and it's been in operation now for over 28 years. FISU is uniquely positioned in that we benefit from working very closely with industry and from this gain a real understanding of the changing needs of the sector on a day-to-day -day basis. But our position here in the School of Food and Nutritional Sciences also means that we're working very closely with our colleagues who are engaging with research and development. And indeed, it's from this dynamic that topics for events like this lecture and webinar series and our short courses are generated. Just before I introduce our two speakers, we'd like to acknowledge and thank Bridie Corrigan Matthews. Bridie is the Director of Taste for Success Skillnet and provided the funding for Foodline UCC and continues to provide ongoing support for its growth and development. Also to thank Mary McCarthy Buckley, manager of the Food Industry Training Unit, who identified the need for such an initiative and continues to drive and inspire its growth. So with that in mind, we really are very privileged to have these two experts with us today. Dr. Pernendu Vasavada, as Vicky mentioned, is a professor emeritus of food science from the University of Wisconsin River Falls and is recognized internationally for his teaching, applied research and innovative training programs in food science and technology, food safety, and also microbiology. Since his retirement from the university, he accepted a two-year assignment as the FDA ORISE Fellow and is involved in the Food Safety Preventive Controls Alliance, the FSPCA, which is designed to help food industry comply with the Preventive Control Regulation for Implementation of the Food Safety Modernization Act. 
So really, we're very lucky because Pernendo is best placed to discuss the topics that are on our agenda this afternoon. And slightly closer to home, Dr. Alan Kelly is professor here in the School of Food and Nutritional Sciences, Vice Dean for External Engagement and also Vice Head of the College of Science, Engineering and Food Science. In terms of teaching, his responsibilities include food processing and preservation, dairy product technology, and also new food product development. His research concerns the chemistry and processing of milk and dairy products, and he's also published over 300 research papers, review articles, and book chapters. He's also the author of several books, uh, one being Molecules, Microbes, and Meals, but one that's very relevant to today's conversation is how scientists communicate. So without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Professor Pranendu Vasavada, who will start the webinar for us. Thank you, Amy Jane. Can you guys hear me all right? Perfect. Good. Uh, good afternoon. I want to start out by thanking Amy Jane, Wiki, and Mary McCarthy Buckley for this kind invitation and giving me one more chance to interact and play with Alan Kelly. He is so prodigious. He is well known beyond, beyond anybody's imagination. And he's his author. I don't know where the guy sleeps and when does he sleep, but he writes in his sleep. And we had a chance to work with us several times. Many years ago, when I did my sabbatical at the UCC, that's the first time I met Alan and several other people. I work with Charlie Daly's group. I work with Mary McCarthy Buckley. And I have a very fond memory of uh, UCC and, and Ireland in general. I have a good news and bad news thing. Good news is this is a virtual thing. This is, this is a, uh, on internet. I wish it was live. But the good news for me is I don't have to wear a jacket anymore. For, since the pandemic started, it is a freeing experience. People don't have to wear a tie, at least I don't, and don't wear a jacket. And when you retire, that's not the nice thing. You can do what you like to do. You are at a liberty to say, no, I don't think so. And I'm glad that Amy Jane and Ricky gave me a chance to say yes to this. The bad news is I'm not in person over there. I would have liked to be in court and maybe as they say, God willing, we might have some opportunity in future. So with that, I want to start uh, talking about the topic at hand, which is SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, and the food industry. We are going to discuss the, the pandemic in the context of its impact on the food industry, particularly uh, the mis misinformation and conspiracy theory that that uh, infodemic has uh, sprouted. We're gonna look at the impact of pandemic and lessons learned. And then finally, one of the, one of the close topic to our heart, both Alan and I, is how you communicate science to the public. One of the casualty of the recent uh, uh, pandemic uh, related infodemic is that people don't know what to believe, what not to believe. People don't know what is true and what is not true. It used to be, that it is in the book, it is in the journal, therefore it is true. Now people say, I read it on the Facebook, I did my own research. That is really not a credible research. And, and so one of the things we're gonna uh, address uh, is what is the role of scientists uh, in science communication in mitigating some of the uh, myths, misinformation, conspiracy theory. Because these are the things, the infodemic, that causes confusion among the public, causes mistrust of the science and the scientists, and, and uh, really hinders our, our efforts to control the epidemic and, and uh, cure the, cure the uh, disease. So this is what we have on our agenda. Since last two years, since the, uh, 2020, the world has faced pandemic. We have had cases of uh, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 in the United States, in India, in Brazil, all over the world, basically. And as of the latest information that we have that I got from the CDC, uh, World Health Organization, and Johns Hopkins uh, 
sources, we have over 405 billion total cases of COVID-19 in the world and over 5.9 million deaths, okay? Uh, in the United States, these numbers are 77.4 million cases and over 915,000 deaths. As a matter of fact, as we speak, th this uh, um, data are from last week, uh, we have a numbers are growing. In Ireland, it's a small country and, and the problem is slightly smaller. We have over 1 million, 1.2 million cases and uh, over 6,000 deaths, okay? This is continuing and we have had a several waves of the uh, uh, pandemic because of the different strains. The virus has mutated, particularly with the mutation in the, uh, uh, in the coronavirus SARS uh, uh, site. And because of that, the transmissibility, the infectivity, the treatment, the diagnosis of the virus have been affected based on what variant you're looking for. Some variants are highly infectious, and these are the variant of uh, concern to the CDC. They are designated as a VOC or variant of concerns. This variant has originated in different parts of the country, uh, different parts of the world. We have variants that started in UK, in India, in South America, in, in uh, uh, South, Af South Africa. And the latest one that we've been hearing about is the Omicron uh, variant. Uh, this, is, this variant is uh, highly infectious, but also it goes down very easily. And the best news I got this morning when I checked the data is in the United States, the, the COVID-19 cases are 70% down from the last two years. So that, that's, the, that's the little uh, uh, good news. In the wake of the um, pandemic, we have had deluge of information, misinformation, uh, myths and conspiracy theories spread through the internet and online. And this has introduced two different words in our lexicon more, more now than ever before. One of them is infodemic. And the other one is infomania. Infodemic, is an overabundance of information. Some of this is accurate, some of these are not. So that's some otherwise known as fake news. Uh, this is what makes it hard for people to find trustworthy sources and the guidance when they need it the most. One of the problems with infodemic and a conspiracy theory is that people who really need to know the most are the, are the victim of this and they can't, they can't find information they need uh, to act upon. A uh, good example of this is when you look at the number of deaths and number of illness and hospitalization because of the Omicron uh, variant, uh, 90, over 90% 90 of the people that suffer from this are non-vaccinated people. Infomania, on the other hand, is a different term. That means compulsive disorder, if you will. This is the desire to check or accumulate news and information, typically via mobile phone or computer. Uh, I, I like to relate to what, what I learned from my uh, teenage uh, nephew, and that is FOMO, F-O-M-O. It's a fear of missing out. You don't wanna be out of the loop. You always wanna know what is, a, what is the latest information, whether it is a TikTok video or whether it is a, uh, uh, any other thing. So this is an obsessive need of constantly checking social media, website, online news in order to find out the latest information. The problem with this compulsion is that uh, when you have infomania, this declines the ability to concentrate. You are trying to do several different things at one time and you can do one thing uh, very easily. When there is a pandemic, when there is a crisis situation, I don't care if it's an epidemic, pandemic, or some other kind of political situation, people want to find out the information. <clears throat> and you might have noticed this. The go-to source for the information of people these days is not the newspaper, is not the credible printed sources. As a matter of fact, newspapers are dying all over the world, right? 
it is an instantaneous information. So people go to the internet, people go to the Facebook, people go to WhatsApp, people go to TikTok, people go to uh, uh, Yahoo, and uh, the TV. 24 hour news, you have to find something to report, uh, whether you say it's a credible news source or whether it is a channel that uh, uh, try to get the uh, viewers. Uh, 40% of the people in the United States, according to one of the survey, uh, are getting that information from the internet. I used to, a student tell me, this is true because I read it on the internet, right? Uh, we used to say that this is true because I read it in the book. Things have changed. Only about 20% of people, Americans, get their uh, uh, information and the news from the published sources. News which is misleading, which is not correct, is a fake news. And according to the WHO Director General, fake news spreads faster and more easily than coronavirus, and it is just as dangerous. We know that when you try to put a video on the TikTok and uh, when you have a clicks and clicks and clicks coming in, what do you call it? It goes viral, right? The news goes viral, and this is what happened to fake news too. As a matter of fact, according to some study, the fake news or the false information spreads much faster and much wider than, than the uh, credible news. Spread of information on social media, particularly Facebook and uh, uh, Yahoo, is, is very troublesome. As a result of that, uh, what, what happens is when you read something that kind of uh, uh, attracts your attention, and either you're buying into it, you don't know what it is, you forward that to a couple of other people, they forward to a couple of other people, they forward to a couple of other people, and pretty soon you have a infodemic going all over the place. As a matter of fact, viral click that you have or viral news you have can go around the globe in a matter of hours, if not days, okay? Um, to combat this, to, to fight the misinformation, myths, and uh, uh, conspiracy theories, several academic institutions, journalistic institutions have, have started what they call fact-checking organization. The idea is to look at the internet sources, particularly Facebook and Yahoo, and find out if the information posted there are correct or not. And so we have a factcheck.org, we have snopes.com, NPR, which is National Public Radio, has a fact check uh, website. And of course, the Mythbuster. If you're not look at this, I would recommend you should look at this. The Mythbuster uh, website of the World Health Organization has a very good information and fact checking uh, services. I'm sure in Europe uh, and in the UK, BBC has this kind of information and several public health agencies have this as well. Okay. So when we're looking at the myths, misnomers, and conspiracy theory, there are several different types. One of the common myths deals with the original SARS-CoV-2. Okay, what it is, where it came from. We also have a lot of misinformation and conspiracy theory, uh, uh, especially dealing with the preventive measures and vaccines, magic food, cures, therapeutics, miracles, and supplements. And finally, we have had to deal with in the food industry, several misinformation and, and conspiracy about uh, contamination of food packaging and food with virus and whether the COVID-19 could be transmitted through uh, food, okay? And we will talk about that in detail. So let's look at some common conspiracy. One of the best one was origin of the virus. Where did it come from? And uh, initially in, in February, March, of 2020, people thought it came from the bat in China or from the uh, mammalian host like pangolin. Uh, some people claim that eating bat soup and people do eat exotic foods in different places. Uh, that was a cause of the spread of uh, uh, coronavirus. More importantly, there were all sorts of uh, uh, information out there about coronavirus being a bioweapon. It was genetically engineered in the lab in China, and it was an accident that it leaked out, or it was a conspiracy that it was leaked out by design. Uh, but whatever case may be, there were a lot of information regarding the origin of the virus. 
And then finally things like, it's a hoax. It's just a flu, it will go away. When the weather becomes warm, there would not be uh, coronavirus anymore. And we had a lot of those conspiracy theories and a myth in the United States, either by design or for political gain. And it was worldwide. It was not just United States, it was in Brazil, it's in Italy, all over the place, okay? Other set of conspiracy dealt with something called 5G at the time when 5G was being rolled out all over the world, particularly in the US. And, and one, of the, one of the interesting thing was that coronavirus was engineered by the wealthy people in the world, few of them like Bill Gates, and they were trying to sell the vaccine to people or embed 5G microchips into people so they can control the populace. And then there were a lot of uh, misinformation and uh, theories about the vaccine, whether the mRNA vaccine is legit, whether it's been approved properly, whether it is effective or not, or whatnot. So we had a lot of conspiracy about that. Other set of uh, mis misinformation conspiracy dealt with the cures and therapeutics. Um, Early part, we know that if we, if we sanitize the surface with the ethanol, 20% ethanol, at least 20% alcohol, it kills the virus. Well, what is good for goose is good for gander. So somebody says, if you gargle with the Lysol or Listerine, but if you drink it, then the virus will be killed because virus is in the throat and that, that should be cured for that. Or anti malarial drug like hydroxychloroquine. It's good for the malaria, but, but people propose that this will also cure the uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, there were all kinds of rumors, particularly in the church groups, that if you buy the colloidal silver ointment so that, uh, or the uh, uh, salve kind of thing, uh, silver uh, kills the coronavirus. And latest that we have last uh, October, November, December, we have a ivermectin. This is the medication that is used for treating parasite in horses and other animals. And in Wisconsin in particular, we had a lot of concern because people were using that to treat the coronavirus. One of my friend at that time was doing this little webinar and he says, let me ask you this, are you a horse? If you're not a horse, stop using it. When we're doing this, in early 2020s, at the height of the pandemic in India, uh, this, this uh, religious guru called Baba Ramdev introduced a launch something called coronal. Uh, uh, coronal was the treatment for the um, coronavirus and COVID-19. And it was launched with much fanfare. It was claimed that this was the WHO certified uh, treatment and it will have 100% recovery within uh, seven days after consuming this medication. There was a lot of uproar about this all over India in the scientific community, in the medical community. And, and uh, there was a concern about this false claim because people were buying and using it. So um, the uh, Indian Medical Association uh, brought a lawsuit against this uh, particular uh, part and it was suspended for a while. The final set of uh, conspiracy that we want to talk about and also spend some more time on it is dealing with the food, food uh, supplements and uh, food industry in general. There, this happens in a lot of different things. You heard about the common cold. You got a tummy ache, do this. You got a, you got a headache, uh, do this. Eat turmeric and uh, it does this eat honey and it does that. There's a lot of what I call old wives remedy or the natural remedy or whatever else, fine. Eating garlic, turmeric uh, would, would prevent or uh, help you treat COVID-19 infection. Adding pepper to your soup and meals can prevent the cure, uh, can prevent the cure of COVID-19. Drinking hot water or drinks, hot drinks, and as hot as you can, you can uh, uh, tolerate. A or taking a hot bath will protect against virus. Non-vegetarian food consumed would lead to the infection. This is in India. There are vegetarians and there are meat eaters, right? 
So the idea is if you spread the word that if you eat meat, you're gonna get coronavirus, uh, well, you can tell the effect. And then this is what is my favorite, a lot of the kombucha and other teas, fermented teas and essential oils. These are very, very uh, good for treating coronavirus or COVID-19. Well, WHO, a Mythbusters has a good information on it, particularly about the hot drinks and hot water and the pepper. It says, hot water will burn you. Coronavirus might die, but you will also burn all your throat and everything else. Other thing it says, adding pepper or eating hot food might be hot for you. It might make you cry. It would not affect the coronavirus at all, okay? So there are a lot of conspiracy there. And some of them are so egregious that the Food and Drug Administration and Federal Trade Commission have taken legal action against these people, particularly some of the tea and the silver uh, ointment that we talked about. And there have been the uh, 483 uh, issued and there is some court actions against them. One final thing I wanna talk about regarding the COVID-19 and coronavirus myth and misinformation. And this is a little tricky because like anything else, there might be kernel of truth. Vitamin C and vitamin D supplementation. We know for years and years and years through our nutritional sciences uh, information that vitamins are good for you. You do need vitamin. And so one of the logic is if a little bit is good, a little bit more is better and a whole lot is bloody marvelous. That's where the mega vitamin therapy uh, comes from. Particularly with vitamin C, uh, going back to uh, Linus Pauling and vitamin C and common cure, it, there might be some effect for the uh, uh, common uh, cold or some other kind of thing, but uh, several studies done to, uh, uh, for large cells supplements of vitamin C uh, show, shows inconsistent data and it says there is no effect on common cold incidence. Okay. Regarding vitamin D, this is a fat soluble vitamin. And if you make a, a dose of uh, vitamin D, there might be actually a negative effect. And again, there are a lot of studies done in Scotland, in England, in the uh, United States. And a lot of these studies are random studies. They are not randomized uh, uh, double blind clinical trials. There is not even evidence. So there is no clinical evidence that vitamin D supplements are beneficial in preventing or treating COVID-19, okay? Vitamin supplements are big business. And whether you believe it or not, uh, I went to my doctor one time and says, Dr. Larson, what about this vitamin D? Should I start taking one? I started doing that because when you hear this for so many times, finally sinks into you. And he says, look, it won't hurt you any, any, it won't hurt you if you take it, only it hurts your pocketbook. If you take too much vitamin C, your kidney works over time, so you know your kidneys are functioning well. So again, take it with grain of salt. There are a lot of controversy and, myth and, from, um, and misinformation, especially in the early part of the pandemic regarding food and, uh, and contamination through the food packaging. Um, FDA, the WHO and, and several uh, public health agencies did some uh, uh, detailed study and then come out with a statement that currently there is no evidence of food uh, or packaging being associated with the transmission of COVID-19. Later on, they updated the uh, uh, guidance for the industry. Uh, this was in August of 2021, last year. And again, it says that COVID-19 is not transmitted through food or food packaging. But the damage was already done. Early part, there were, there were news items from the China that imported food in China uh, uh, were detected for having a coronavirus contamination, food as well as the food packaging, okay? Um, to combat that, there were several studies done in the United States, uh, there is an institute called uh, uh, AFI, American Foods and Food Institute. They work with the North Carolina State University to do the uh, uh, literature survey and find out what is the current information about the transmission through fomite and food. And again, 
the, the idea was that food is not the source of COVID-19 transmission or contamination, okay? Okay, so we have all this mis misinformation and, and uh, conspiracy theory. What is the impact of this and a pandemic on the, on the um, food industry? Well, food industry had a huge impact to say the least. A lot of things have changed. Pandemic exposed a lot of the problems we had in industry that we never really addressed, particularly dealing with the supply chain, okay? Uh, estimated $87.55 trillion damage was done worldwide. And in the United States, it was $16 trillion, okay? The pandemic closed down businesses because stay in this place, or shut down the countrywide uh, shutdown. Restaurants closed, meat processing facilities in particular were affected. And we'll talk about that a little bit detail uh, 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 next. We had a supply chain issues. A lot of the product, the PPE and the food where we are global transportation issues. And so that created a, sp uh, a spot shortage. People started hoarding foods like they normally do. And so there were some shortages created. And it also uh, gave rise to the lot of online shopping and online business. DoorDash or the uh, Uber Eats, those kind of things uh, flourished. And one thing happened that industry said, I do not need a 50 brands of potato chips. I will just concentrate on five. So they, they, they concentrated the SKUs and, and uh, streamlined the processing. There was a big impact on the employee health and wellness. You hear about the worker shortage. People get sick, they don't wanna to come to work or they wanna quit because they can work online or at home or they don't have a child care uh, situation. So there were a lot of problems with the uh, essential worker shortage. And when the government uh, uh, said, you are essential, you will come to work, you are a meat processing plant, you will stay open because people need to have the supplies that alleviate the situation a little bit. And finally, there was an impact on the regulatory information uh, enforcement. People were affected by the pandemic. Uh, industry was affected by the pandemic. FDA and EHOs and all the regulators, inspectors, auditors, they were not immune either. They were affected by that. So a lot of the regulatory uh, enforcement went online. They were reduced by tremendous numbers. Travel was curtailed. And now we're coming back uh, to full force uh, uh, because the, uh, the cases and numbers are going down. Okay, let's talk about the impact on meat processing industry. This is, this is very interesting and somewhat important. The COVID-19 infection in the United States, there were outbreak of infection meat processing plant in South Dakota and North Dakota in Iowa meat and poultry plant, and they were shut down, okay? Uh, when there is a shutdown in meat processing plant, that affects several things. It's not just the processing not going on, but you don't have an animal coming through the line. You have to cull the animals, you have to deal with the uh, 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 poultry carcasses and those kind of things. Also, there was a, a studies done in Ireland and in Germany and the United States about what causes the transmission of the infection and how we can mitigate it. What can you do? The industry is gonna be open. We're gonna process the meat just like we normally do. So what is gonna be our new normal? What are we gonna do to mitigate those things? So impact on meat processing is very significant. Over $13.6 billion in total economic uh, a damage to the beef and cattle industry just in US. I don't have a number for the Ireland. Maybe you can look it up in the FSA uh, I, uh, or uh, someplace else. Um, culling of millions of animals and uh, poultry, that happened. This is a waste of food, okay? 57,000 meat and poultry workers are infected and 284 died, okay? The thing about meat plant is, if, you, if you're familiar with this abattoir and the processing facility, it's a unique kind of system. There is a close contact. People are working in a close proximity. Uh, it's cold, it's wet, it's noisy. If I wanna talk to Alan 
and Alan is sitting five feet from me, how to yell at him, how to shout. So when I shout, all the air droplets will go out and the airborne transmission of infection can occur. So one sick worker who is at work can infect a lot of different people. Um, these are essential workers, they were at work. So what happened that the government, in order to keep the meat industry open, they come out with the guidance. CDC is Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, that's the lead public health agency in the United States. And the OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Their job is to look for the safety of the worker in workplace, okay? Some of the companies violated the OSHA guidance and they were fined $29,000, which is still appeal and is in the process. So what was the guidance the CDC issued? And this is, sounds very normal to us now, having been involved with this. Of course, CDC says you should have a safe distance, right? At least uh, six feet in between the workers. This may or may not be possible in some of the industry. If, if the worker is sick, you allow them to work from home or let them go home and do the medical treatment. Wear the mask and PPE. Uh, do the spot check, the temperature, right? And, and also provide the culturally sensitive, culturally appropriate educational material. This is important because at least in the United States, a lot of the meat plant workers do not speak English. They come from different region, they live together, they travel together. So you have to be careful how you, how you provide the credible information to them. And that was the guidance the CDC provided. One nice thing about the meat industry and food industry was that we had something called GMP for years and years and years. We knew we were doing a, a, a sanitation and cleaning. We knew we were doing hand washing. We knew we were using gloves. So that helped quite a bit in mitigating the transmission of COVID-19. So what were some of the key intervention that industry did in order to be operational and, and uh, uh, minimize the impact of COVID-19 infection? Well, stagger shift. Don't let everybody come at the same time. Flexibility and scheduling and the leave policy. If somebody is uh, absent, let them go to work. Uh, if somebody is sick, let them go to work and don't dock them the pay. Face covering and PPV. Uh, people erected the plexiglass barrier where they can. So there is a physical barrier against the transmission of our uh, virus. There was a lot of uh, uh, emphasis on sanitation and disinfection, okay? Deep cleaning, more frequent cleaning. And that, that, that was uh, employed in the meat industry and food industry in general. We know that the COVID-19 spread through air, it's the airborne transmission. So there was a lot of effect on understanding how is the HVAC system, what is the airflow, what is the ventilation, and try to mitigate the COVID that way. And finally, training and education. And when I say training and education, and name is you are in the training unit. This is vertical as well as horizontal. This is not telling the workers that to do this or don't do this, telling the CEO, telling the consumers, have the very comprehensive uh, uh, education based on the scientific information, okay? So what did we learn from pandemic? Well, one thing we learned, which is now finally people recognize and realize that it is not a foodborne. It doesn't, you don't get COVID by eating food. As a matter of fact, there is a thing called uh, uh, pandemic 20. A lot of people put uh, 10, 15 kilos in this time, staying at home, eating eating potato chips and, and uh, watching videos, okay? Uh, we emphasize the role of GMPs and PPEs, sanitation and environmental uh, uh, disinfection. We deal with the employee health and wellness. Uh, supply chain is very fragile, we know that. If you have only one supplier and that was in China, you were shut down. You have to find alternate sources. You have to do supplier uh, verification and, and uh, qualification, and you have to find the local sources to the extent possible. In this regard, I think Ireland was always ahead of that. People like the local thing. 
I, I remember Darina Allen trying to say, eat the food from my farm. It is only two yards from where you eating. You're sitting in the farm and eating. Um, locally produced food and raw material is very important. Uh, food waste gain more attention. We know that you can minimize this thing. Emphasis on uh, hygienic design and equipment. One of the major problems we had that the equipment we had, you cannot really sanitize and clean properly. So there is a much emphasis on that. And then also on air handling and ventilation. Education and communication, particularly communication is, is more. When we talk about science communication, which we'll talk in a second, science communication more about communication than science, okay? So let's talk about this. I will start with uh, uh, giving you some of my favorite quotes about science communication. This is my way. And I think I might've learned a little bit of this from Alan, uh, you know, one of the best way of flattery is to steal from them. I steal from the best. So Andrew, which is a very famous scientist, and nothing in science has any value if it is not communicated. You might be the greatest Nobel Prize winner, but if you didn't publish, people don't know about you, you didn't communicate it, it didn't happen, okay? I like, I like uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. I don't know if you guys get uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson in uh, Ireland or not, but he is a very colorful uh, astrophysicist. And, and he says the good thing about science is that it is true whether or not you believe in it or not, okay? We have in UK, Sir Mark Walport says, science isn't finished until communicated. And communication to wider audience, not just talking to other scientists and graduate students, but communication to wider audience is part of the job of being a scientist. And so how you communicate is absolutely vital. Alan knows this, he wrote a book about this, okay? Tony Fauci, Dr. Fauci is a poster child, if you will, of the communication about the uh, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2. He says, I enjoy communication very much. I think the scientists need to communicate. That is the understatement of the day. And finally, my favorite quote comes from the, none other than Albert Einstein, make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. In the, uh, other words, something you have to tell the public, don't dumb it down. Make it simple so they can understand and appreciate what you're telling them, but don't insult their intelligence and dumb it down. So science communication is very important. We have people like Tony Fauci and Mark Wolpert doing a lot of science communication from the podium on the telly and the newspaper, uh, but we need the food scientists to step up to the plate. Everybody in the industry need to be the advocate of true science-based information regarding the COVID-19, regarding the SARS-CoV-2 and the transmission. And particularly, uh, so, uh, shout from the rooftop, this is not a foodborne. You would not get a COVID from eating food. It doesn't come from the package. <clears throat> I shouldn't tell you, but I'll tell you this, even in my, home, my own home, we were washing all the food we bring in with the Lysol, with the soap, with the water, scrub it with the sponge, right? Have you ever tried to eat broccoli and lettuce after soap and washing? That tastes soapy, that's not good. Anyway, I'm gonna turn it over to Alan to talk about science communication in particular, and then we'll come back for the Q&A uh, uh, if you have any questions or do some discussion. Thank you for your attention and Alan, over to you. Thanks, Pranendu, and um, thanks to you for setting the scene really well. I'm just going to speak for maybe about 10 minutes to make sure we have time for uh, time for some Q&A. And I'd, I'd remind everybody to just, as Amy, Jane and Vicky said at start, and thanks to them for the, the superb organizing of today, please feel free to put your questions into Q&A. Now, I hope you can see my slides. I think if we've kind of taken one lesson hopefully from PC it's it's there's a lot of sources of bad information out there so who do you trust and and I guess you know we're scientists we're, we're going to say obviously you trust the scientists and I want to just spend 10 minutes talking about how that has worked right because the goal of effective and I think Fernando has laid this up well you know it's all about translating research into impact 
and science has evolved over a long period of time as a professional activity, um, pr procedures for doing that and for communicating it. And things that worked, I think we could say worked pretty well, that suddenly were put through an unbelievable shock. As the rest of the world was, the world of science communication was put through an unbelievable shock. Processes that were designed to operate at a certain rate, to operate at a certain level, suddenly had to operate at 10, 20, 50 times that level. I think we have to recognize it's probably not exaggerating to say there's never been a single greater pivot of scientific research in the history of science than there was in the period from, say, December to uh, December to June. Uh, 2020, December 2019 to June 2020. I often stop to think about how how many projects, how many people were working on one thing and working on one problem that suddenly they stopped and said, okay, this is what my lab is working on. This is what we're doing. This is us now. And everything else becomes as important. So does the greatest pivot of any, to focus the greatest concentration of scientific minds on onto, um, onto a single problem? a problem that affected every single person. It wasn't abstract, it wasn't somebody else's problem, it was everybody's problem. It was affecting every scientist outside the lab as well as in fact, affecting them inside the lab. So the question is, <laughs> how did the system cope? And how can we maintain the standards and qualities of science to get that translation from research into impact as quickly, but as rigorously as possible? So science communication, it's evolved. Like it's easy to communicate, you can communicate globally, as we've seen, you know, through, through Facebook and TikTok and Twitter and whatever else, it's easy to tell everybody in the world something. It's easy to come out and say, such and such as it works against COVID. You know, pepper's good for you, hot water's good for you. But science communication is different. We like to think it's different. We like to, to say it's different because it's not a free-for-all. It's not an unregulated environment. It's a highly regulated environment. It's evolved structures and standards to mediate the flow. And, and one of the key things is something that's called peer review, that that science when it's submitted for, that in between the, the researchers and what they do and the world and the impact they can have, there's a gate. And that's a pretty tough gate to go through. And it's called peer review where the work is scrutinized by experts in the field to make sure it has the rigor and the credibility and it was done properly so that only that this should be a filter, a filter that filters out the bad science, if we want to call it that, right? And in a, in a good, high-quality medical journal, and some of the top journals in the world are the Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, or medical journals, right? And, and nobody's going to send them a paper unless they think this is a really important piece of research. And they're still probably going to reject 90-something percent of those as not being good enough. So this isn't a trivial process. This is a, a very stringent process that's been there and has evolved over probably about 150 years to protect the integrity of the scientific record and how it impacts on the world, right? So it should filter out the bad science and only the good science goes through and impacts then as this flow charts, you know, on the public and policy and practice. And then it can be circulated. You can have press releases. You can talk to the media. You can put it on Twitter. You can do whatever you want, but it should have been through this filter. There are other routes as this flow chart shows preprints for workers put into to kind of archives to say, okay, this hasn't been through peer review yet, but in the interest of sharing it early, people can see it, but note there's a caveat. This hasn't been, it hasn't got the stamp of authority to peer review this. So, and it's an amazing edifice when you stop to think about it because who does peer review? Everybody does who is involved in research. We do it all the time. We, we review the work of others and provide feedback to the journals. The community sort of self-regulates for everybody's benefit. And it's a kind of an edifice which was working pretty well, which is maybe we could say pretty fragile, but it was hanging together and doing well. But it was like a gate that was designed to allow a certain number of people through it. And suddenly the crowd grew beyond anything that could have been ever envisaged to be trying to get through that case. So the deluge, if you look at papers and articles back from the, the early months of the pandemic, like the terms deluge and tsunami were being applied regularly to not just to the cases, but to the flow of scientific information. You know, about uh, like this was in uh, like way back in August 2020, over 23 and a half thousand articles being reviewed. Scientists, here's a headline, scientists are drowning in COVID-19 papers. How can we do this? You know, here again, these are early plots, but showing, and this has continued exponential growth compared to previous pandemics of the number of papers that are published. But if you think that if the system is working well, probably only a tenth of the, the work that gets submitted gets true and gets published and is deemed to be good enough, 
you can think that you multiply this by a factor of 10. And you also think who's like, who has time to do this? Who's time to write the papers or the busiest people who are doing the research? Who's there to, re to review the research and to give advice on its publication standards are the busy researchers who are doing the research. So you can start to get a sense that the system that was designed to work at a certain pace at a certain rate, it suddenly comes under enormous stress because of this. And how do we balance? We can't say, okay, we're going to take six months to review a paper if it's literally, and it's no joke to say, life and death stuff. So how do we balance speed while ensuring reliability? And, and the answer is, is it didn't, that there were lots of cracks appeared. It was like a dam that had to deal with a much greater volume of water and cracks appeared in the dam. You know, journalists, the idea of things being taken out of preprint archives that weren't peer reviewed, but taken as gospel and brought forward and uh, added on. People picking up things that hadn't been properly reviewed and taking it. There was such a hunger, as, as BC referred to already, a hunger for information, an infomania, that, that people were grabbing science from, from this process at all different points in the process without necessarily applying the proper filters to decide if this is something which, which needed to be done or not, which was worth relying on. And there's a website people might be familiar with or here, it's great to, to watch called Retraction Watch, which looks at the op opposite of publication, which is, you know, retraction when a paper is deemed to be unreliable or unsafe and is removed. And up until a couple of weeks ago, they had 208 papers in, and in the grand scheme of things that have been retracted or deemed unsafe. And in the grand scheme of things, that the hundreds of thousands by now of papers to published, that's probably a very, very small percentage. But each of these could have had a major damage in terms of people picking it up, of doing something with it, of, of making decisions based on this information, on it being picked up by the media or being picked up deliberately to spread. And some of the, the and, and you can go into the website and it lists pages and pages of these reviews of these articles that have been retracted on all kinds of aspects. And, and if you go back to some of the cases that Prenendu has talked about, like hydroxychloroquine, you can see that the papers that, that initially came out to, to, to support some of the claims that are being made have been retracted. And one of the problems is retraction is a kind of a very nerdy scientific term, you could say. And usually the attention that's paid to publication of some of the controversial is in several orders of magnitude higher than the attention that's paid to its retraction. People don't realize that it was retracted afterwards. So this is part of the, the system kind of the pressure the system came under, under you know, uh, extraordinary pressure, probably led to some of the issues that have already been alluded to. And, and another thing just to, to comment on something that's always fascinated me is, is what one thing that, that it's, it's illustrated is the need for scientists to be communicators, not just on a scientific level, but on a whole range of levels. That scientists, and we can think, and, and there are scientists around, scientists in UCC, uh, and right around Ireland, if we just take our, our community, who, who we can see who are now household names because they're on the media, they're on the, the television, the radio, on the websites, the newspapers, so much for this. And scientists like this who now need to, and I think it was always true of every, or increasingly true of every scientific professional, is you need to be able to talk to a whole range of audiences. And you can picture scientists who on a, on a, on, on a, in a, any given week could be talking to experts in, in peers who are absolutely familiar with that area, who they can jump straight into detail with, who are fellow scientists. But then the next day they could be talking to doctors who are trying to apply some science to, to, uh, to treatments. They could be talking to, to patients and to, to lay people. They could be talking to the media. They could be talking to the public. And every single one of those different audiences is going to require a different approach, a different language, a different way of, of communicating science. So science communication today is a multi-layered challenge because scientists are expected to be able to pivot and talk about their research in the right way to all the different audiences. What do they need to know? What do they know already? What do they need to know? Why am I communicating with them? What change do I want to exert by talking? To? And, you know, and starting, always starting with the audience of who are they? And how do I communicate? And I think it's just a really interesting is, is the, the, the need for science to have a whole range of wavelengths over which it communicates, for it to reach all the audiences who need to know what comes out of it. And it's something I think that that's been starkly illustrated. And I'm going to just, and I'm going to wrap up now in a second, but I was very, I, rem I still remember I was in a hotel in West Cork and the, the, with the family on the, the 3rd of, of January, I think it was, or the 2nd of January 2020, when I saw a tweet from an Australian virologist called Ian McKay about a strange cluster of pneumonia cases in, in Wuhan in China. And that was, and for some reason, I remember getting a chill. I remember where I was. It was the first time 
I, I, I had heard anything. And he's been a, a great source on Twitter of information. He came out with a model a while ago uh, that was widely circulated. And I, I really liked it. He was talking about the Swiss cheese model of, of virus defense. And he was talking about how there's lots of layers to it. There's masks and there's distance and there's hand hygiene and there's uh, limiting time in crowded places and there's ventilation and there's testing and tracking. And you can see them there and there's vaccine. And he said, none of them are perfect. But if you line them all up together, because the virus can get through any of the holes because it's like Swiss cheese. But if you line up enough slices that, that the holes don't overlap and then you, you get an effective blockage. Right. And and as soon as I saw this, and I, I did respond to it, but I said, I said, you know, that's basically that's HACCP. That's what we in the food industry would, would recognize uh, uh, as as the hurdle concept of, you know, that that it's not just one thing in our food that makes it safe. It's a combination of factors. And I just thought it was interesting to see what to me as a food scientist was a very common kind of a um, an idea, the idea of hurdles being applied to virus protection. Uh, but I think it's still a very powerful and, and well circulated metaphor. So in summary, and to, to, to hopefully a five minutes for Q&A at the end, there have been, as Pernendu has, has really nicely outlined, many myths, misinformation, conspiracy theory around COVID. I still remember back in the early days, back in February, seeing an infographic on the back of the Irish Times completely confused me because it talked about, you know, protecting yourself from COVID. And it said, make sure all your food is thoroughly cooked. Uh, what? What's that got to do with anything? Why are you telling us to make sure our food is thoroughly cooked as a virus protection? I never still got to the bottom of how that came out, but I suppose the lesson was in the early days, none of us knew not anything and we're all, I suppose, to a certain extent panicking. Myths and mis, uh, myths and misconception, you know, deliberate and the difference between misinformation and disinformation, the provision of, of bad information kind of, uh, you know, by accident is quite the right word, but differentiating that from, from deliberate spread of misinformation for nefarious means. Uh, and I think we've heard, you know, all the impacts on the supply chain, on, on the, the food supply, on the food industry itself, all the changes in practice. And I think there was a huge degree of, of, of high quality of standards in a lot of the food industry in Ireland, in the US and elsewhere, but has been brought even to a higher level. And maybe there's going to be some long lasting benefits of this if we can take some, some silver linings out of cloud in the future for things that have been introduced to prevent COVID that could have broader food safety implications protecting the public. And, and as, as Pernendu has nicely introduced the idea of local food minimizing waste. You know, and, and then the roles of, of, of internet and social media and spreading bad information and the roles of scientists and the challenges of scientists to try and keep up with this, even to try and keep up with consuming the information that's being produced, let alone produ producing it and, and reviewing it. And, uh, and, and always the way, how do we come up with creative and effective ways of communication with, with industry? I mean, I think that that food model is a lovely, the Swiss cheese model, I think is a lovely, and you know, I keep coming back to it because it's a nice food analogy way of, of trying to communicate a lot of information and I think a very simple way, it goes one, a very effective communication tool. So just to, to finally to, to uh, thank uh, Foodline UCC and uh, thank Skillnet for, for the, the support for this program. Thanks to Amy, Jane and to Vicky for organizing it. Obviously, thanks to my, my co-host and our primary host, uh, speaker today, Pranendu, and our contact details are there. And as I say, I, I as it's been mentioned already, I published a book. It was actually pre-COVID. Uh, it came out just, or it was written pre-COVID. It appeared during the pandemic. Uh, so it doesn't actually, the second edition will talk about COVID. But if anybody's interested in, in, in the history of peer review and communication and communication in science, the details are there. Okay, so um, I see, and there's a, a question in the q and I'm not sure, will I stop sharing? And, and Pernendu, if you want to unmute. Uh, there is a question from Noel Egan. Do scientists take enough notice what? new social media sites like TikTok to get what? their messages across and contract infomania? I think that's that's a really that's a really interesting question. I'm I'm happy to jump in with a quick off the cuff answer and, and Pernendu, you can oh and I see others in the chat too. Um I think that that many scientists that there is a generational gap between many scientists and the audiences they need to communicate with and trying to keep on top of this as well as everything else, I think has understandably been a challenge. But I think what's interesting and what's emerged is a whole new class of science professionals who are SciCom, you know, that this, the, like hashtag SciCom, who are people whose job it is to communicate science, to work with scientists 
and to try and help them to translate them. I think, you know, this is that that point has illustrated the need for people who really understand this, because I think it's not a safe assumption to assume that every scientist who's who's doing the kind of work that needs to be communicated will have a hope of trying to figure out what's the best. How do I get onto TikTok to do that? So I think having a, a group of people who are professionals who bridge that information gap and help to get the word out has been another lesson, which I think is really useful. Fernando, I don't know if you want to join in there. With yeah, yeah I, I got a quick comment. Uh, my reason for not being on TikTok <laughs> is I don't look good. People are still on TikTok have a nice bikini and they're looking pretty and I'm ugly. So I'm not going to subject somebody to that. But seriously, though, a lot of scientists do the uh, Twitter. There are a lot of uh, uh, people I know that will tweet the things, but uh, they are not on the TikTok. Maybe they should be. Facebook is also very common. But again, that is a limited thing. Uh, Alan is right. There is a generational thing going on there probably also. Perfect. Okay, and mm -hmm. I can see we just have something in the chat, just, um, I suppose, an add-on for a point. Um, just a thank you for a very interesting and informative webinar, which I'm sure we'll all agree with. And just Stephen as well saying the increase in hand hygiene alone is a big plus. Yeah, I think it, I think there are lessons in how we do things that are, are, are going to last and will have impact on, on things like food safety in the future, for sure. Um, and, it, it, you know, it does, and I see a question is, uh, or a comment has been made there about how do we come back from false news or how long does it take? You know, how do you, you know, how, how do we successfully undo some of the damage that's been done with some of the information that's been shared? And does, th these aren't you, easy you questions. You don't. You can try all you want. Because what happens is that once the thing is on the internet, the bad information or misinformation, that stays forever. And four, four years later, it will come back. And Alan mentioned the retraction. When there is a bad science published somehow, there is a retraction. Retraction does not get the same publicity as the, as the first information. So it's very hard to combat uh, that kind of information. You have to make up your mind. You have to be educated yourself to see what is feasible, what is, what is credible, what is not. Thank you, Pranendu and Alan. It really was a very insightful hour. And if there are further questions, um, both Alan and Pernendu's contact details are on the website and on the contact information sheet that everyone would have received to sign up to this. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us in Foodline UCC and the Food Industry Training Unit here in the School of Food and Nutritional Sciences. We're delighted that you're able to join us. Thanks again to Alan and Pernendu. Uh, so many of you have joined us. And we look forward to seeing you guys again soon on our next webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Goodbye. Everyone. Goodbye. Oh. oh, I see. We have one comment yeah. at the very last minute. Have I been disconnected yet? Am I still here? You're still here. Go for it. Yeah, okay. The science of virology for the general public is not overly complicated. There are enormous amounts of experts make the information more and more complicated for the, for the public. Comment, please. I think that's that's a really interesting point. If I can take that, you know, as, as a, again off the cuff, it's it's like saying not all scientists are going to be familiar users of, of social media. Not all scientists are naturally good public communicators. I think they wouldn't be have got to the point where they they're at if they're not good scientific communicator. But being able to talk to a very specialized audience is not the same as being able to talk to a talk to a general audience. And I think there's there's definitely cases where people have made, made, you know, any aspect of science you could think of, let alone COVID, more complicated than it needs to be. And that's why I could comment, like, there are some people where, where maybe the, the role of the professional science communicator isn't quite as necessary because they might be naturally good at it. But for others, the ability to have somebody who can work with them to turn that into a digestible form without losing the sense and the accuracy of it and turn it into more digestible forms. Again, because I always say the secret to communication of any sort, but science communication in particular is Yes, always start with your audience. Is how do you get to the audience? How do you get them to do what you know to do with the information that you're communicating? You know, how do they change their behavior? How do they understand what what do you want them to do, and how are they going to receive your information in the most successful way to achieve that goal? Benendu, do you want to comment on that about yeah, uh, how uh, complicated uh, it needs to be? <laughs> yeah, just just quickly, um, communicating science to public is a learned skill. It, it, is, it is not innate, not everybody's a good communicator. Yeah. 
But as academics, we have to instill this in our students at undergraduate level and postgraduate level. We make them do the seminar. We make them do the poster presentation. We mm -hmm. teach them how to do science communication to scientists, but we do not teach them how to communicate with the public and the peers. Yeah. So, so they, they say, there's a need for that at the, at the undergraduate level and, and uh, high school level and all that. And the second you... thing is, I, I would make a final comment, uh, go back to Einstein's thing. When you scientists and talking to people, know your audience, make things simple, but not simpler. And the only thing I'd add to that, that's, that's uh, I totally agree. The only thing I'd add to that is I think 10 years or so ago, um, I was doing graduate studies at UCC and, and at a national level, there was a big change in Ireland and the attitude to that, to your first point there, which is us not teaching students. And a number of initiatives were, were launched specifically designed to tell PhD students that you had to um, you had to learn how to communicate your science to your general audience. And there were, we had showcase, and this was replicating universities all over Ireland, we had showcases where people had like a thesis in three, three minutes, explain your research, you know. You know, literally uh, we had a, a journal we introduced called the Boolean, which was about science made accessible to general, or not just science, but all the PhD research in UCC. So I think there was a big national pressure and it's now accepted that this has to be part of the training for scientists is they have to learn some of these communication skills. But but Prendendo, I just referred to one of my favorite programs and uh, um, in popular science communication, a favorite initiatives, which has been a longstanding one in the US, which people mightn't, mightn't have heard of and might, mightn't believe, but you can Google it if you don't believe me, it's called Dance Your PhD. Mm, well, you I've never heard design, about that. Design a piece of interpretive dance to explain your research. So I have never seen somebody try and explain COVID virology to interpretive dance, but I'm sure somebody's tried. But if you Google dance your PhD or type it into YouTube, you'll find quite so, quite some some spectacular ways of, of trying to turn research into a, into a into a very unusual means of communication. I think I think you can give, you are giving a lot of ideas to Vicky, who has the impressionable mind. <laughs> There's one in every group. <laughs> the webinar next webinar will be delivered through the medium of interpretive dance. <laughs> right. Thanks everyone, thanks, and thanks thank for you. staying with us. Bye, right. bye, bye. goodbye. Bye.